So thank you very much, Steve. And thank you, by the way, for putting on this conference for the last three or four years, and all of you for coming. Um, this is the kind of effort we need to move, move this forward, as my good friend Dr. Esselstyn said this morning. Um, Dr. Esselstyn also said, too, I remember uh, something to the fact that uh, he's of an age now, like me, uh, that we're really pretty passionate about this. I'm very passionate about it. I think this information is so extraordinarily, valu extraordinarily valuable. Um, I got into this business 62 years ago, a little while ago. I'm 116 years old. <laughs> now, more to the point, I'm three years younger than Dr. Esselton. I mean, three uh, months younger, you know, almost the same age. So we've been around, around the block a bit. But I want to talk to you about uh, the subject, the science, the science of nutrition. That's where I've been for all these many years. And uh, it's been fun, great fun uh, working in this field. Also, it's rather controversial for a lot of folks. And we have a lot of family and friends and other citizens in our society who don't quite buy into it. So it's been really quite a challenge. But I do have to say, and I'll say it again, this is easily, in my view, the single most important and significant medical science of all. It's really quite tragic, as a matter of fact, it's sad, that medical schools don't teach this subject. And so I I've, I've thought a lot about this. I spent about 20 years, actually, in national policy development, where, you know, this is science meets up with the politicians, if, in a sense, and saw a lot about, you know, why it is that this kind of information is difficult to convey. Uh, so it's a, it's a big topic. It's a very big topic. And, and so as I think about this and as I have become quite passionate about the idea we have something here that's really, really important, um, and I look, you know, what's the best way to get this out there? Well, I'm maybe a little prejudiced, a little biased, but I think getting the science right is really important. We have a lot of people speaking to this issue, but unless we get the science right, then it may not have a sustainable power to go into the future. So I really want to talk about, you know, in a sense, how I came to know this. I think uh, you've, some of you have heard parts of this story before and apologize for that. But I'm trying to draw a, a big picture kind of thing to sort of convey the idea that it's important. As many of you know, uh, this is me, as I say, 116 years ago, whatever. <laughs> Uh, I grew up on a dairy farm, milking cows, and then went away to school to Cornell University eventually, graduate school, and uh, did my doctoral dissertation, as a matter of fact, on trying to figure out, along with my professors, to try to figure out, basically, how could we produce more protein, especially animal-based protein, which we called high quality. That's where I came from. So my personal background, my original education, was all about promoting protein and protein of that high quality kind, animal-based. Then I had an opportunity along the same track of going to the Philippines. In fact, I was a coordinator of a nationwide program of feeding malnourished children with my senior colleague at the time. And in an effort to try to address the question concerning malnourished children in poor countries, we were all about making sure they got enough protein. So as I, as I look back, it was protein, protein, protein. And that's where we're going, and that's what, in fact, a lot of people thought. We really had to have more protein. But unfortunately, I, there was a question that I ran into on the golf course of all, days, of all things one day. Uh, my colleague, who was a surgeon in the Philippines, was telling me, about the fact that he and some of his colleagues were uh, working on young children with primary liver cancer. And it turned out, because I was wearing another hat concerned with the area of nutrition, um, I got the impression that, and that's all it was, it wasn't published, but I got the impression that the few children, or I should say the few families in the Philippines who were consuming the levels of protein like we do, their children were more likely to get liver cancer. And so that was enough to 
propel me to come back home to Virginia Tech at the time and get an NIH grant to begin to question that, that, that issue. Because if we're going there to sell protein, essentially, and now we see this kind of thing, we've got to resolve that question. Now get, and so I'm going to share with you just a little bit of data here in the beginning on some of the original research that we did. Um, but before doing so, I want to show this representation here uh, and just give you some fixation on uh, essentially uh, what, what levels of protein mean what. It'll become apparent in a moment or two. Uh, but this is a sort of a range of protein in intake, if you will, in the U.S. population. And we did our original studies on experimental uh, rodents or rats, if you will, whose intake of protein and requirements for protein are essentially the same as about humans. In any case, let's, let me uh, kind of frame this level of protein. It'll mean something here in a moment. Uh, we require, as protein goes, we require about 5 to 6% of the total energy as protein. 5 to 6%. It's really quite low. That, it may surprise many of you. Um, and then that was done way back in the 1940s and even earlier to establish that number, and it's been supported over the years. But that was done experimentally. The 5 to 6% or so was ex done experimentally. And so when it came time to tell this to the public for public information, they jacked it up by a couple of standard deviations, and they called it the Recommended Dietary Allowance, or RDA. So the RDA, many of you may have heard of that term, uh, has been the, the guiding post, essentially, about how much protein we need. Too often, people think that's the minimum amount. That's not. That's an ideal level. This has already been pushed up above what we really need. So the 9% dietary protein is fine. That's all we really need in the theory. Uh, but our range of protein intake is somewhere between about 11 and 22, maybe even a bit higher. And our average protein intake is 17, 70% 70 of which is coming from animal foods. So it's just, I just want to set that stage. So we in our society are consuming really excessive amounts of protein compared to what we really need. Uh, and the experimental levels that I'm going to briefly show you in a moment was comparing 5% with 20%. Okay, so 5% is down there, you know, at the sort of minimum level. The 20% is up near the higher level. It's just above average. And so, as I said, uh, experimental rats require about the same amount of protein as humans. So this is, I consider, relevant. After seeing the, or hearing about the information about children getting protein in, in, the, in the Philippines, uh, I, this report came out from India. It was an experimental animal study, again, uh, they were interested in studying liver cancer like I was in the Philippines because it's a big problem in third world countries. And so they did a little study uh, where they had two groups of animals, both groups of which had been exposed to a carcinogen that gives rise to liver cancer, and they decided to feed 20% and 5%. And their, their hypothesis was, uh, and it would have been anybody's in those days, the higher levels of protein would have protected against the liver cancer. So that's what they were interested in doing. And so they did the study, it was the reverse. The animals that were fed the higher levels of protein, 100% got the cancer, the 5% none did. So it was increasing protein, increasing cancer. That was the question. Really a kind of a tough proposition uh, coming into the world, you know, believing of the importance of protein. So now really quickly, I, wanna, I, I used that in our research early on to learn something about actually just the science just fundamentally to the science. What, what's going on here? So we were interested, for example, in learning what is the mechanism by which this really works. And so, in addition, we wanted to see if we could replicate what had been done by the Indian researchers. This is a representation here, essentially, of the sort of time scale of cancer formation. Just for your information, cancer, in theory, in reality, actually, starts with a mutation. You know, a normal cell is converted to a cancer cell by a so-called mutation. Chemical comes in, activates, binds to the gene, if you will, converts it, you get a new, new cancer cell. That's the first stage. The second stage is promotion. That's the time during which these cells start to divide. Like infant cancer cells, they start to divide over time. 
takes quite a long time, maybe, in some cases. And the last is the progression. That's when somebody notices, oh, oh, I got a problem here, they get diagnosed. And that's, of course, usually during the time of metastasis. And so it's pretty serious. So those, those in just a very arbitrary way, just kind of arbitrary, initiation, promotion, progression. I want to just fall back on that in a little bit. So here, I'm going to share with you some of the early studies we did that really got me <laughs> to thinking about my own sort of background and my prejudice. Namely, if we study the question concerning the formation of cancer in these animals for the first 12 weeks, in this particular case, we were able to do that. This was done some years ago. It says 1992 there, but actually this was done in the late 70s and, and 80s uh, prior to that. But in any case, we did this study. Let's see what happens here. Starting out with a genetic mutation, giving them 5%, like you know they did, no cancer. In spite of the fact that, they, that they, there had been a heavy exposure to the uh, carcinogen or mutation agent, mutagen, mutagen if you will, 20%, look at that. So we're here, seeing here now, which something was in agreement with what I just described what the Indian workers had done. So then we did something else many different things, but I thought, this really caught my attention. We said, what happens if we turn, what if we change the diet? You know, start out here, back and forth. And so we, for the first three weeks, 3% 3 protein, 5%, 20, uh, you know, 20%, 5%, and then 20% again, 5%. In other words, of all the things, I, I, one of the major things I did during my career Actually, I think this year was one of the most significant, but still today, I'll come back at these uh, uh, people don't want to hear this, that you can actually turn cancer on by higher protein intake and turn it off by pulling them. That's a, that's a pretty extraordinary uh, sort of demonstration, if you will. There's one more sort of wrinkle to this little story here. In this, in this case here, we said, okay, what if they, all of them got the mutation we just fed them 5% protein for a while, maybe 10 weeks or so. By this time, we assumed, okay, carcinogen is gone, no more problems. So we just came back later and gave them 20%. And these cancer seeds, still lying there, being dormant, got turned on. And that led to a very provocative idea. We all have, I mean, I'm jumping way ahead and I can't get, have the time to tell you all the other data. But basically, we all have some cancer cells in our body, or would-be cancer cells, at least the infant ones. And it's, it's routine that they're there. Okay, and then again, some, at some point in time, they start to grow. When later on, we start, start fertilizing them with the, wrong, with the wrong diet, essentially. So that was an exciting idea there, too. Um, so early genetic mutations don't disappear. They kind of hang around. All we need to do is kind of put some food on them. Let them grow. So, get back to my little scheme here that of, uh, talking about the way cancer forms and starts and grows and so forth and so on. Notice the second stage there, promotion. There was some evidence way back since the late 30s, and especially a little bit, sort of imagining some interpretation involving um, lung cancer, smoking, that, that cancer could be reversible. Not, people not know why, and it was an idea kind of hidden in the background, but nonetheless, Promotion was generally accepted by those who were in the field as possibly being reversible. That certainly was supported by what I just showed you. You know, we could turn cancer on and off. So then when it came to another study, uh, another question I should say, of knowing how does this work? By this time, I'm, I'm saying to myself, uh, gosh, this can't quite be right. This is too striking. I felt like, you know, in a sense, I was touching the third rail. Because uh, to challenge, to, to, to challenge the, the, the value, the health value of animal-based protein was a pretty serious matter. So we wanted to get in and find out what is the mechanism, what's the biochemical mechanism by which this works. This is fundamental, I must tell you, to a great extent of the entire drug industry. Because people like to find what is the mechanism, which enzyme, which this, which that, that might be causing the problem then you can find a chemical. I'll come back to this. You can find a chemical, just block it. So we looked for 
quote unquote, the mechanism. Now just listen, a bunch here. In the beginning, the high protein diet, for example, did things like increase the rate of uptake of the carcinogen into the cell compared to the, the low protein. So, oh, maybe that's it. Just eat more protein, more carcinogens getting in our cells and causing us problems. So we went on and turned out though, carcinogens, when they go into the cell, they get metabolized to produce products that are more active. So active, they bind to the DNA. Some pretty nasty stuff. That enzyme is in the liver. And so we wanted to see if the high protein diet affected the enzyme activity. It did, two ways. Within hours of consumption, the high protein diet turned on the synthesis of that enzyme, so there's more enzyme. Now it can you know, form more stuff in a hurry. And the second, it changed the characteristics of the enzyme, very complex, very complex molecule. It changed it in a way in which it also speeded up the rate of formation of these very reactive products. So we got three possibilities here. I'm saying, wait, which one counts? Which one are you going to deal with? Uh, and it increased the binding to the DNA, as I said. Then, in turn, it decreased our normal ability to repair that kind of damage that goes on all the time. This is a high protein diet doing it. So, and then we, and I won't go into this kind of detail. The second phase, we kept on looking. This is a period of about 12 to 15 years. Very extensive research. And that, with a lot of uh, graduate students and postdocs, and et cetera. And so, and there are some things that are really exciting there. I could give a lecture on each one of those, or <laughs> two or three hour lecture, but they're very exciting. And, and here's what, what came into view. I couldn't decide which one of those things is the key right reaction. I mean, who, who knows? I mean, it's, it's really difficult. Um, and, but what that high protein diet does was 10 of those reactions, there's 10 there. It turns on eight of them. It, it increases their activity. That's interesting. Turns them all on. Two there, it actually decreases. And it turns out those two that are decreased is DNA repair and so-called natural killer cell activity. We've got, well, it's more than one, but we've got two really important mechanisms in ourselves that protect us as we go forward and we get exposed to carcinogens and so forth and so on. We've got two mechanisms that kind of hold it. it. In other words, it repairs the DNA. When that happens, and it's a very efficient process, it probably repairs about 99.99% of those uh, mutations that occur. So we're kind of in a, in a safe territory. Nature's been pretty good to us about that. But pro high protein diet does, not only does it speed up all the other stuff, it comes in and blocks the mechanism we have for our safety, our fail safe system. And so it does also for the second one. The second one is the case where now the cell has been, a, it's become a mutation, it starts dividing, dividing, dividing. Now it's recognized as a cancer cell. The immune system steps in with this little thing called natural killer cell activity. It kind of kills those cells. Really interesting. Now, when you stand back and look at this, you say, which one of those are important? And all, occurred to, all of a sudden occurred to me, there is no such thing as one thing. Now, this is a really challenging notion for the drug industry. It's a challenging for the very concept of what drug, drug development is really all about. That one nutrient coming in and doing this tsunami of mechanisms, and far more, by the way. This is just the ones we looked at in those days. And so this was, a, this was an awareness, a consciousness, if you will, sort of saying to me, you know, nutrients don't act, they don't, we don't consume a nutrient and it does this and then it causes that. That's what a lot of people assume. Now, I'll come back to this. This is what I call a principle. It's a rather disturbing principle in many different ways, okay? So, it's, it, what it says is nutrition, each nutrient has, is operating by multiple mechanisms. Exciting idea. Okay, that protein was casein. We were just using it because those of us in research, that's what was available. Casein is the main protein of cow's milk. So I'm thinking it back, you know, I, 
I was on a dairy farm milking cows and all that sort of stuff because milk has good protein in it. The protein that was turning on the cancer was casein, of all things. Incidentally, like other animal proteins, I won't going to defend that proposition at this point. But it turns out, we, I, we sort of said, OK, what if we try some other proteins to see if they do the same thing? And we chose a couple of plant proteins, soy and wheat. And we fed them up to 20%. That's the high, higher levels, you see. They didn't increase the cancer. So all of a sudden, wow, this animal protein is doing this. And these plant proteins are not. It's, again, sort of an indication of we're onto something here. This is kind of exciting. It turns out animal proteins do tend to do things all together like each other. They're a little bit different here and there. And plant proteins also do something different. So we have this dichotomy. These over here doing unfortunate things and these over here uh, little better things, OK? Um, incidentally, I was in the I've been in the cancer field all my life. And we do have, as a, as a matter of course, a major program in the United States that's been going on for more than 50 years to check out the food, which chemicals in there that might cause cancer. You know, environmental chemicals and stuff like that that we all worry about. There's a formal program to decide which ones are carcinogenic and which are not. I'm going to come back to that at the end. I'm just simply telling you about that. I've spoken several times to that particular group. It's a very official body, very official laboratory, and so forth on the basis of the criteria that's used to determine which chemicals cause cancer, which ones can we call carcinogen and which ones don't. Casein is the most relevant carcinogen ever identified. And some of you may have heard me say that before. It's a very provocative idea. I, I was just discovering as I was going through it, I was getting into more trouble all the time. See, something was happening. It wasn't in the textbooks. It wasn't in the scientific literature. And by the way, I was teaching for much of that time either uh, introductory biochemistry or a little bit later nutritional biochemistry, upper class nutritional biochemistry. So I'm in the territory teaching it like it should be, you know, like, like we sort of assume it should be. I'm seeing this kind of stuff. It doesn't fit in the, in the these kind of ideas popped up from time to time, so I'm very conscious of the fact that it's a little bit disturbing. Uh, in this case here, I published a paper on this concept that carcinogens don't count like we think they do, and published that in 1980. Got a lot of attention for it at the time, but it, some thought, well, that's a bit of quackery, get out of here kind of thing. It's still, but it's still there. Now I'm going to show you one more dimension of this sort of walking through the science to get some ideas. So the question then becomes, does this apply to other diseases other than cancer? Maybe heart disease, maybe this, maybe that. And, and there's some data. You have to kind of get in there and look at the you know, the information on this particular point. But let me just tell you, just for uh, a general proposition, that if we compare protein intake from 4% up to 20%, let's say, compare that against the risk of getting some disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, whatever, what we tend to see, and this is very t traditional in nutrition, for a bit, we have a normal level of, of nutrient consumption that doesn't do anything. That's ideal. That's it, where our bodies are working well. So up to about 10%, as I said before, that's all the protein we need. Everything's fine. Only when it's in excess of 10%. I mean, protein is an essential nutrient. We all know that. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have adequate amounts of protein. So we only need up to 10%. But almost every one of us consume more than that. So we're asking for trouble by doing that. Now, I want to show you how that breaks down and giving us some information that's kind of useful. First off, OK, there's the minimum. I said that before. There's the RDA. There's the average. Here's where, here, where we are. It turns out plants can supply all the protein we need. Even if we just ate potatoes, which have the least amount of protein. We could actually survive on it. We get enough protein. So a plant-based diet, and I want to say this, how many of you have been challenged by friends once you've made, a, made the U-turn? How many of you have been asked the question, where do you get your protein from? Every hand goes up. 
just demonstrates a point. That's our, that's our national psyche. That's the way it's been for generations. Very interesting question is the, the whole history of protein, by the way. But in any case, it turns out you don't need to eat animal foods to get the protein, which a lot of people have assumed. In the beginning, most people, still unfortunately a lot of people today, as you just indicated by your hands, a lot of people today say, well, you need my protein. What they're saying, I need my meat. I need my dairy. I need my eggs. That's what it translates to. And a lot of people really aren't fully aware of this concept. The plants have enough. No problem. And incidentally, it can go up to 20%, they showed, without really worrying about it. Things eat a lot of legumes and beans and so forth and so on. Like that, you get, enough, you get quite generous amounts of protein. No problem, because it's in a form of whole food. Another story, though. So anyhow, here's what happens. So we get up to higher levels by consuming animal food. We get into trouble. And here's what happens. When, you know, we, we only consume a certain amount of calories. That's our sort of daily allotment. If we make more of that proportion as animal protein, then what really happens, we're decreasing the consumption of the foods that matter, the plants. So when you talk about a high protein diet, meaning a high animal food diet, two things are going on. One is we're suffering the consequences of the protein itself. And secondly, we're decreasing the stuff that's doing us some good. So when we talk about a high protein diet, generally meaning a high animal food diet, just keep in mind there's a couple things going on. The protein itself, through all those mechanisms, and I wish I had time, I could show you lots of stuff that's been ignored for the last hundred years really showing that animal protein is a problem. I mean, for example, put some, let's say subconsciously we said, okay, everybody else more protein, I'm going to get around 16, 17%. And of course, what happens is it subtracts, you know, the a similar amount from plant foods. Uh, now, just to throw this in here, just as an illustration, but there's other charts like this. This is 1975. There's a good friend of mine, Ken Carroll, Professor at the University of Western Ontario and some others had been doing some of these kinds of studies comparing populations with respect to how much protein they consume compared to how much disease they get. I think you would find this chart here really interesting because this higher animal protein, higher breast cancer risk, and that line is pretty perfect. Pretty perfect. That was originally published by Dr. Carroll as Dr. Fat. And because it was fat, that's what led to the idea, let's consume low-fat foods. You know, let's consume skim milk. Let's do this, let's do that. The same thing was also published for heart disease. And so this, the other part of this line is, other than the fact that it's really, really kind of interesting, it's going, it goes right through the origin, the XY origin. What that says theoretically, no animal food is necessary, not only not necessary, as soon as you start putting animal food in your diet, you're asking for trouble. It's starting to, theoretically at least, sort of increasing the risk of disease. It's true for breast cancer. The same has been sh shown for colon cancer. The same for heart disease. The same for uterine cancer. And in an indirect way, the same for osteoporosis. And so it goes. I'll come back to that. So if you want to keep one take-home message in all of this, it's the one that you'd find them the most difficulty with most people. Don't eat animal food. There's nothing there that we need. I'll come back to that. On that point, when I uh, decided to write the book, I should tell you this, and you know, I'm, I'm in science, I'm doing stuff, it's all very exciting and so forth, uh, but I'm coming home and kind of leaning on my wife a bit and complaining about this, that, or something else. One more thing happened. And so um, she told me, she said, why don't you write a book? Sit down and just tell the public. That was the basis of the generation of the China study, by the way. Um, and so in doing that book, I did it with my son, who was in theater at the time, good writer, and that's why he started doing it. Now he's a physician, by the way. But in any case, when we were writing the book, 2002 to 2005, that period, I was generally aware that this thing was operating in some other diseases, but we wanted to go back and look a little more formally into the scientific literature to see if this effect of protein existed for any other diseases. 
And here's what we found. Look at that. All these, some of these are pretty serious, and some of them sort of more of a nuisance kind of character. But this, basically, we can say this. The whole food, plant-based diet, at least prevents, suspends, that's, that's stopping the growth of it, and or cures these diseases, as illustrated by Dr. Esselstyn this morning. And for example, with heart disease, it reverses it. So all those diseases, I thought, wow, that's a general concept. Now we're to begin to challenge, let's say, the drug industry, who like to operate on one thing for one cure, et cetera. And so there they all are. It led to another, I call it a principle, that's different from what is generally uh, advertised by nutritionists. The whole food, plant-based diet, nutritional effect is broad. Dr. Esselstyn made some reference to some other diseases too. We had this as well. This effect operates on a very broad scale. Fascinating. It's also very rapid. Ten days to two weeks. We do, when I say we, I'm talking about both of my sons actually and some others. And Dr. Originally Dr. Esselstyn had done it. And Many others are doing it. We do the, what we call these uh, jump starts or maybe immersion programs or different names for different things. In other words, take a group of people, just give them the food. Hey, drink, just eat this for 10 days to two weeks or 10 to 20 days. The results we see are so fast. And so it's one of the best selling points of this idea. Just let people use the food. Now, the other thing about this diet too is if it's sustained, and it has to be sustained, we can't use the diet as a, like we do drugs. Okay, we got a one week course of drugs or two weeks or something. Uh, now it doesn't work that way. This kind of diet, when we start it, and it does some good things, we have to stay with it. If we go back to the old way, forget it. Everything, all these weeds start growing again. So this has to be a lifestyle, it has to be continuous. Um, and so at least, I'm sorry, you probably can't see that so well. It says whole food, plant-based diet treats illness and disease with no side effects. Fascinating idea. You know, we, you know, our grandmothers told us to eat vegetables. And you remember that, your grandmother saying that? I mean, you know, this idea of eating vegetables has been a pretty decent idea for quite a long time. And because you won't get a disease, disease in the future. That's called preventive medicine. Medical schools have departments of preventive medicine. They've been, quite frankly, kind of useless. They don't do much. So I don't even think about preventive medicine anymore because the better idea, and this is the idea for the future, a whole food, plant-based diet treats illness. Now we're getting into some sacred territory. When people get sick, just change, see what happens. It's a really exciting idea. When you talk about treatment, now it's immediate. Now you see it. So I, I just kind of like that idea there. The majority of these diseases can, in fact, respond in that fashion. So there we have it, whole food, plant-based diet, you know that story. Um, now, one more, one more idea I, I want to get into as well, via, you know, in, in regards to the strength of the evidence. <clears throat> Sometimes people, a lot of people think, oh, I don't, I don't want to eat that food, I'll just get it in a pill. And so that was an idea that sprung up in, in big, big time in the 1980s. <clears throat> it actually started uh, as a result of a report that I was a co-author to. Well, it was a National Academy of Science report, there were 13 of us. And this is the first report that was actually published by an institution, a major institution, on diet and nutrition cancer. Uh, I was only one of two on that 13-member committee who actually was involved in the research. Um, and we said whole food, a whole food. And that's when a lot of the problems actually started for me when I started saying whole food and plants and, you know, Nutrition could do this and that and so forth. But one, one idea, this whole food idea is important. I want to illustrate that as follows. After the uh, 1982 report came out and got a lot of attention, it was a most sought after a report in the history of the National Academy of Science at the time. Um, we, as I said, we said whole food. And we said, we're not talking about nutrient supplements. This does not apply to nutrient supplements. But the industry had other ideas. They actually took out full page ads and Time and Newsweek, U.S. News and Report. What were the words? Forget the other one. No, yeah, Time. Anyhow, they took out ads talking about this amazing new information that we had developed on the, you know, from this report. 
what they were talking about is using this information to put them into supplements. So some research started on that. And, you know, we said don't su this supplements don't mind, but there was some research that started to check us out on that. So they did a study here on beta carotene. Beta carotene, as you may know, is pre vitamin A and so forth. So what they did, they worked on heavy smokers who get cancer because they're affected by high uh, reactive oxygen, you know, in, in from the smoke and so forth. And, and the idea was, okay, all these smokers, they have a high risk of getting lung cancer. Let's give one of them some beta carotene and others not. There's a joint study between the United States and Finnish scientists, 29,000 male smokers. And they're going to follow them for, you know, up to eight years, see what's going to happen. If beta carotene, which comes from green and leafy vegetables, as you may know, and that they're, what we knew at that time, eat green leaf vegetables, you get less lung cancer. So, okay, take the beta carotene out, put it in, uh, give them this, and that study went on. The food beta carotene decreased lung cancer by a significant 19%. Kind of interesting. And I'll show you more data. It's just, you, you'd be find it hard to believe that you can actually, there's really good research showing that cigarette smokers, if they eat lots of vegetables, they tend not to get lung cancer. That was something that wasn't told very loudly in those days because everybody was interested for good reason to prevent smoking, in a sense. But anyhow, food beta carotene associates with less lung cancer. There you have it, it's significant. Supplement beta carotene on the other hand actually increased lung cancer. So what's going on here? This is ridiculous. Here's a nutrient that's supposed to be the one that actually prevents lung cancer. It's an antioxidant. Beautiful. When you put it in a pill, it doesn't work. That caused a furor at the time. And there's been a number of studies shown since of this kind of information, really convincing that supplement the nutrients in the form, and when it's taken out of the food and put it all by itself, it doesn't work the same way. Vitamin C, here's another little example of that. This is done by a friend of mine at Cornell. Um, here, I'm, I'm talking just for sake of the uh, argument. Uh, he, he took 100 grams of apple, and he measured it, and it had 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C in it. Apple's a pretty good source of vitamin C. So it had 5.7 milligrams. And then, so then, and, and what that means is just arbitrarily, 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C gives 5.7 seven units of good vitamin, good activity in the body. That's, a, that's equivalent. It turns out, though, that when you have the whole food form, that 100 grams in the beginning, it has this 5.7 milligrams. You measure it in a whole food form, it says 1,500 units of vitamin C activity. So what you get in pills, it's not even close many times. Maybe it has the opposite effect. So the whole supplement industry, the nutrient supplement industry, which is now standing at around 30 some billion dollars a year, 50% of the people are using nutrient supplements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it really, for the most part, doesn't work. It can have the opposite effect. I was actually asked, since this came from our report, 1982 report, where we said don't use supplements. And so they started, and that what challenged the National Academy of Science decided to challenge the entire industry <clears throat> in the uh, Federal Trade Commission hearings in Washington because they were making claims that were false. They were false. And they asked, I was the principal witness, they asked me to represent them over a three-year uh, sort of uh, trial, uh, being in the docket, sort of reviewing the claims they were making to see if they're true. So I, I followed it fairly closely over the years and now we know they don't really work. This is not the message we're talking about here. It just is not. Um, okay, so now, See, one of the things I, I liked about nutrition is that instead of talking about one thing at a time, it's not a single mechanism. It's not a single nutrient I can show you. In fact, so-called nutrients are far more than 40 or 50 nutrients and probably the, the thousands of different kind of chem chemicals that have nutrient activity. And, and does it apply to humans and all this? Here's some questions that came up for me at the time. First off is casein, which we were using, is it representative of animal protein in general? I'm going to say yes. Just answer these. Animal protein is a representative of animal foods. It, you know, when you're eating animal foods, it's not only protein, you're changing these other things I already said. Is it too much animal foods, too little plant foods? Which is it? 
Well, we can't measure it exactly, but basically they're both at work, and the question is whether it applies to humans. This is the kind of thinking that I thought was important to consider at the time we had an opportunity to go to China to look at a big population of people. Uh, and in China, in the 70s, they had published a maps, these color-coded maps, of how much cancer occurred for 13 different, 13, 12 or 13 different cancers, how much cancer occurred in all those different counties, and with a color-coded business like this. So the first senior scientist from China to come to the United States, Dr. Chen Zhishu, came to my laboratory, uh, and we got, went back to China and organized a, a big research project between the United States and China. It involved 6,500 families and 130 villages and so forth and so on. And what we wanted to do was to find out if we could learn something about the role of nutrition in causing diseases to be so high in those different places. And so, and this had already been noted before to some extent, that was the original China study, China project. It's actually 896 pages. It's a big thing like that, like an atlas, just loaded with all kinds of information that we collected from blood samples and urine samples and food samples. And I just want to show you just one little piece of evidence from that study. We had access to death rates for those different diseases. And what I learned, just looking at them, all those diseases, either in the one, diseases on the left or on the right, they're all correlated with diseases in the same group. So here's a group of diseases that I thought was really significant. It's over here, the cancers, diabetes, coronary heart disease, they tend to go together. They tend to be in the same location. They tend to be in the same communities and so forth and so on. So then the question was, what is mostly related to these Western diseases? It's blood cholesterol. Cholesterol was an indication. Cholesterol doesn't cause these diseases, it's an indication. And so what we found was, as cholesterol levels in China were only 127 milligrams, in this country like 210. So as we saw cholesterol start to go up, in the blood from very low levels, that's when you start to see these diseases occur. Um, I hope I didn't make that too confusing, but these Western diseases, uh, mostly in the, from our data, was highly correlated with the amount of cholesterol in the blood, even though it was generally low. I'll, I'll return to that in, in a moment, a little bit later. So here's the words to match what I'm sort of showing here. A whole food plant-based diet with little or no added fat, sugar, and salt solves more illnesses than all the pills and procedures combined. I think that's a pretty remarkable concept because we're living on pills as a means of uh, sort of going forward. And the nutrition itself can do far better. So I call this effect of nutrition, not on the basis of one nutrient, which you know, we get such arguments all the time about how much of this nutrient, how much of that. And it's silly arguments, I, I must say. Uh, not terribly meaningful. Uh, and. Uh, the, the effect of nutrition, the really remarkable effects of nutrition is the whole food. So I'm looking at it this way. Multiple nutrients, multiple mechanisms, multiple disease, all of that. I call it holism with a W. It's a whole thing kind of working together. It's just truly a remarkable thing. Whole food plant-based diet. And I, I just sort of summarize it by saying this is a highly interactive, integrated, holistic system without making protein a cult. That's what we've lived, with, we've lived with now for more than a century. We don't need that protein from animal foods. It causes all kinds of mischief. If we just do it that way, we get the results. In contrast, the practice of medicine is reductionist. Stop and think about it. Our medical system is founded on you know, singular ideas. You go to the doctor, most people, <laughs> They go to the doctor, they want to walk out with a pill. And so it's so much ingrained in our minds that we will get well if we have a pill to solve this problem. And so that really is not the way it works. It's like one disease, one cause, one mechanism, uh, one drug treatment. And usually the drugs that we use, almost always really, they're foreign compounds, they're toxic, and have side effects. So I'm talking about Two different worlds, vastly, vastly different. This is also medicine and practice of medicine. I call it a very reductionist profession. 
This is, and, but here's what we have to live with. This is why holistic nutrition is not taught in reductionist medical schools. There's not a medical school in the United States that teaches nutrition. Not one. Yet it's the single most important medical science of all. And the reason that people in the medical profession want to argue about this and say, oh, nutrition doesn't count, is because they're operating from a reductionist framework. To them, that's science. And if we can't tell them, I'm taking very general terms, but if we can't tell them which thing in food does what, then it's not a good idea. Well, there is no such thing as this doing that and causing this. It's really the holistic sort of concept. Also at NIH, which funded most of my research over the years, um, there's 28 different institutes. This is, the, this is the major biomedical research agency in the world. There's 28 institutes, one for cancer, one for heart disease, one for this, one for that. There's not one called the Institute of Nutrition. So think about this. Doctors are not trained. Actually, they're not getting reimbursed. There's no mechanism available really for them to be reimbursed, not with reasonable co compensation. And also, we don't do research on it. So that, in a nutshell, is why one of the chief pushbacks from the medical profession it has been, it's changing, but it's been one of the chief pushbacks because they don't call it science, they kind of rule it out, uh, but yet it does more than anything they can possibly do. Now, historically, I'll get wind up here toward the end saying some of the more exciting things, I think. <laughs> um, there's two nutrition myths that we've had to live with. When, when I talk about um, science, we in this community, as well as in the general establishment community, we've made a lot of mistakes. And we're still actually, these days, practicing mythology and saying things that are not true. But here's two things that we do rely on. First, we think there's a need for high quality protein. I already pointed out that's not necessary. And we also tend to assume that nutrients act independently. Both of those are wrong. Both of those are wrong. And that really covers a lot of territory in terms of um, thinking about things. So future information, I would argue, needs to be effective, affordable, convenient, and reliable. When I say reliable, I'm talking about science-based. We've got to go back to the bench and argue the case on the basis of science, evidence-based material that's actually been published, reviewed, and checked out. Um, now, to get into this, so that I, I have a new definition for nutrition. And it comes from, I'd, one way I can describe it is this way. Biochemistry was sort of my background to a great extent. I used to teach biochemistry, and this is a bunch of reactions. Some of you may know them as the Krebs cycle or the glycolysis. How many have heard of the Krebs cycle? Anybody? Yeah, quite. You know the story. All these reactions going on here, the fascinating stuff. Um, and I was teaching this many years ago in the early 60s to students, and I was excited about this too. You learn about what each enzyme is doing, which reaction, you get in those kind of details and so forth and so on. In the meanwhile, somebody else is discovering a new reaction. This thing is growing, getting bigger. Everybody's excited. Oh, we got a new reaction. This is associated with leukemia, or this is associated with that. I mean, that's the way the story was unfolding. And you know, we, we used to have maps on the walls and hang up. We, it was a kind of race to see who had the latest map of all these reactions. Eventually, it was that. And that's just a mere tiny, tiny fraction of the total. And I'm showing you, you can't read that, and I intended that for exactly that purpose. So you got all these reactions going on, all the time. It's amazing. Pharmacology of the big pharma, their thesis is to find out which one of those reactions is the one that causes something that we don't like. And therefore, we'll get a chemical, like a drug. Can you imagine a drug weaving its way through all that to hit that target site and not have side effects? No, it doesn't happen. All drugs have side effects. And a lot of times, they don't work anyhow. So that's the drug therapy. Single reaction, multiple side effects. We know all drugs have side effects eventually. They don't do what we think, certainly not in the long term. Nature has provided us with nutrition therapy. 
all these marvelous things in food that somehow do multiple reactions because that's the way disease forms. Disease forms by a, a whole host of hundreds, thousands of reactions possibly working together. When we eat the right food, nature has figured out a way to address all those issues, in a sense, simultaneously. That's what the whole food plant based diet really does. It's been known for, for a long time. I like to think of it going back to the cell. You know, the cell is the unit of biology, we say. It's got lots of parts to it. Every cell is like a universe. It's as complicated, as complex and complicated as the universe itself. So many things going on. As in, we can never, ever even begin to create something like a cell. Not by, you know, not by taking all the parts and putting them together. But in that cell, let me stop and think about it just a little bit, what that cell is. There's somewhere between 10 and 100 trillion cells in our body. As I like to say, I, don't, I haven't met the person yet who counted them. <laughs> but in any case, a lot of these cells. And each, each cell is not visible, it could easily sit on the head of a pen. And a lot of cells are doing, a bunch of cells doing this. Maybe they're making insulin. Over here, they're making something else. In other words, and over here, they're fixing our eye, keeping our eyes in order so we can see, so forth and so on. So all these different cells have abilities to do their own uh, chosen path, if you will. Um, it's not visible. It's like a micro-universe. And all these cells are communicating with each other. And if we were, in theory, able to identify each one of those reactions in a cell, and, and, and in a sense, you freeze it in time. What if we learned this instant, a millionth of a second later, it would be different. So we get the time element here. We get this infinite numbers of things working together to create a response. And it all changes. It's just, it's response just, just like that, constantly. You're sitting there, just think of trillions of cells in your body, all operating, talking to each other, with all, all the resources available to it to create that response. That's why the whole food plant based diet works. It doesn't work because we adjusted the level of omega-3 fats or omega-6 fats or even adjusted for that matter the uh, level of... Uh, it, it just doesn't. That's not the way it does. So we, it's one of the sources of the enormous confusion we have in this field. And I'm speaking to the scientific community as well as to those sort of on the outside, wanting to know just what do I eat kind of thing. Um, now let me give you an illustration of how this is, causes us problems. I'm going back to those, those charts. Now, here's the case where this story I'm going to tell you <clears throat> started with the assumption that, diet, that serum cholesterol causes heart disease, or cholesterol itself causes heart disease. Not really true, by the way. Cholesterol is an indication of risk, but it doesn't cause heart disease. In any case, in those days, it was, the thought was, oh, okay, higher cholesterol is going to cause heart disease. We've got to block it. So they found the, the reaction, the one thing in, in here that starts off the chain of reactions that it does it, acetyl-CoA. And it goes through a series of reactions here, eventually to synthesize a group of compounds called steroids of which cholesterol is one. So here we go. Up here, it forms cholesterol. Cholesterol is an, a very important indicator of risk for heart disease, obviously. It's an indicator of risk, too, for cancer, I should say, from our own work. But so it's, we found, OK, acetyl-CoA, and they looked at half a dozen reactions there on that pathway. And they found the one, one reaction, of we, oh, we can block that. That's the key rate-limiting reaction. Remember, I told you that's what we were working for, always do rate limit reactions. So they found it. I'm sure schematically showing it there. So they got themselves a chemical to block it. Statins. Hundreds of billions, or not, tens of billions of dollar industry these days. Dr. Esselton this morning told, told about his view about how valuable statins are. I happen to agree totally. But here we're trying to fix a big problem by giving statins, by blocking that one reaction. Just on intrinsically, and in common sense levels, it, should, it was never intended to work. And when people are doing that, they're not using you know, Dr. Essence's diet. So you see where all this comes from? We're focused on just one chemical 
we find out one reaction and we make one chemical. If we find, you know, we find one thing, to, the antidote to block it. And we're finding out it doesn't work. We spend tens of billions of dollars on that idea. Um, and there's just a quick summary of Dr. Esselton's uh, you know, marvelous work in this area of heart disease. You know, and the, the, the most recent study that he just talked about this morning, of course, shows that CHD, um, that, that people who are, listen to him, they comply, uh, they end up with less than 1% risk of getting a subsequent event, at least a period of observation that he was involved with. In contrast, those who said, I'm not going to listen to you, you're going to go do what you want to do, 62%. Isn't that a big, isn't that a big effect? That's huge. That's huge. And of course, it's a whole food plant based diet. I'm going to show you just another a depiction of that. This is uh, some data, at least the first four bars there were data brought to me by an acquaintance. Uh, I, I wasn't sure whether the, of the reliability, but if I since went, did a little checkup, I just want to give him credit. Here's, here's what this shows. This is a comparison of heart disease interventions on coronary mortality. And over in that left-hand bar, these are people untreated. I don't know how he got those names, but he set that as a standard. That's the number of a, amount of deaths that occur when you don't get treatment, let's say, in a certain period of time. In contrast, th those who are given stents, yeah, they can maybe relieve a little pain. There's no question about that. But in terms of reducing mortality, there's really no evidence. They don't reduce mortality. And so somebody going to the doctor and discovering they have heart disease, they want to do something else too with them. So they advised giving them statins. The best data that I could find, and I say Dr. Essen, I think, think and then I've heard others say this who are in, the, in that trade, in that business, statins really don't work. Here, the best case scenario that I could find is that statins, I mean, that, that yeah, the statins may reduce coronary mortality by 9%. That's the best case scenario. A lot of people say, no, it can't, it's full of uh, side effects and so forth, it doesn't make a lot of sense. In this particular compares of vegetarians, they're a little bit better. Theirs was reduced, their mortality is uh, actually reduced by 31%, at least in this particular model. So there's some effect of the vegetarian diet. Uh, and then in turn, I added on this last one, thanks to my friend, Dr. Esselton, where he got the 1%. Here's what the whole food plant-based diet does. Isn't that a huge difference? I mean, well, I don't know what it is. 90% or more people who go get, to go get treated or get extensive statins. And they're suffering side effects and they're paying $20,000 a year minimum. Somebody's paying it, put it that way, over that time. And in contrast, these people over here go take a, I just came up with a rough number. <laughs> Every year, maybe buy a book or two, attend a conference or whatever. Let's say it costs a hundred some dollars out on average a year, and look at the results they get. So here we are spending huge amounts of money to get nothing in return, a lot of misery, side effects, all the rest. And in contrast, use this whole food plant based diet, different story. So this is essentially this one I'm talking about reductionism. Going for the detail, exploiting it, making money on it, instead of looking at the other way around. I'm going to show you something about the cancer business, which is my, my territory. This, this, this information is really quite remarkable. I don't know whether you know this or not. This was a study that was published in 2007, I think. My gosh, it's already 11 years ago, I think. It's a group of Australian-American researchers who went back and wanted to ask the simple question, do chemotherapy agents work in cancer? And you know, it assumes that they are because uh, chemotherapy agents have been used now for three or four decades. It turns out that the average cost of developing new chemo cytotoxic chemotherapy agents is 1.3 to 1.8 billion dollars. Actually, it's closer to 2.5 billion. To make one new chemotherapy agent, to make 2.5 billion dollars. And this study was done on surveying a total of 22 different cancer types. And it, but then, then the question, because we spend that much money on chemotherapy, is it working? And what they found was that five-year survival rates were increased only by 2.1%. Only by 2%. That's nothing. 
that have been better off almost having nothing. I don't want to go so far as to say chemotherapy has never worked. There's a couple of cases where it, it, spares, it gives you a few extra months or something like that. Chemotherapy agents are not working. And it causes a lot of misery, and we're paying a lot of money for it. It's ridiculous. We don't know for sure what the answer to cancer is compared to heart disease and some other. We've got a lot of evidence, still anecdotal stuff. My younger son, who is now a physician, he's a physician at the University of Rochester Medical Center carrying on some of this research, now has the funding to, in fact, do a study on cancer patients. We're very excited about it. Um, it's, a, it's on metastatic breast cancer patients, where he's going to be taking those patients, giving them the whole food plant based diet, letting them use the other treatment too. We have to kind of do that for the IRB rules, but start that and then compare others not taking the whole food plant based diet. I'm really very excited about this. Uh, we should have some early results in another year or so. Anyhow, if we. I, I just happen to believe, and we've obviously sold the idea on this concept. We have the experimental data that says this should work. Cancer is a nutritional disease. Why don't therefore we treat it as a nutritional disease? That's what we're trying to do. So wish us luck. Because I think if this works, like I think it will, of all the things that I can think of to turn this whole field of whole food based on, on its head, that would be it. Because if we, feel, felt, we could find that a whole food plant-based diet can treat cancer patients, with or without some drugs along with it, but hopefully without, that will really have a major, major effect going forward, I'm sure. All right, I do, and I've made some reference to this. I, I never used the word vegetarian or vegan because that's not the way I got into this. It was strictly science, and I do have to say this. But I also want to honor those who have chosen to eat like a vegetarian. I mean, it's good reasons. A lot of it was uh, basically uh, um, ideological, if you will, and welfare in particular. And uh, that's, that's obviously an excellent reason. In fact, of all the reasons people make to get onto some, something like and actually stay with it, and I think of the people who are making decisions on the basis of ethical, ethical reasoning. Because you, once you decide what's ethical and what's not, you tend not to go back. So I want to say I sort of fully support this, but in a nutritional sense, vegetarian diets are not doing so well. 90% of vegetarians are still using dairy, fish and eggs in some cases. And what we see from the studies of vegetarians, eh, they're a little bit of an advantage, sometimes both ways, causes confusion. And there's just enough confusion to cause the people with, who are opposed to this to say, oh, that doesn't work. So it's a bit of a problem. Vegans is not also vegan either, because vegans are still using a lot of processed foods, high in fat, refined carbohydrates, and salt. So I've been uh, trying to challenge some of my colleagues in this field. Let's go back to the bench a little bit and see if we can't make this point that what this needs to be real, what we need to rely on in this case is good science, good clinical evidence, get it public, get it out there. Because we're talking about the entire world, if you will learning this. And if we just only enter the argument and make the argument based on either vegan or vegetarian reasons, we make a little progress, but not much. Um, here's something to make that point. Here's the best and biggest comparison of meat eating diets, vegetarian and vegan diets compared to whole food based diet. Total fat is the same, believe it or not. Total fat is indicative of the kind of diets that are being consumed. Uh, sugar is the same. So the vegan and vegetarian practices in reality are ending up sort of, unfortunately, in a very similar place as the meat eaters. Some gain, yes, because the vegans especially are avoiding animal protein. But um, I think it's something to keep in mind because I am really interested in going beyond building on what we sort of know from those communities. Building in a sense that everybody gets to know this. And we can show, in fact, it really works. Anyhow, here's some questions that I question just to give you, I'm writing a new book on this. When I get into this kind of thinking as of like holistic nutrition and getting into the history and seeing what works and doesn't work, we're left with some mythologies. Dietary cholesterol causes heart disease. It's said oftentimes just very generally. I say, no, it doesn't. That's been known for more than 100 years. There's something better that's involved in causing heart disease, not dietary cholesterol. It's called animal protein. That research was done first in 1909. 
And then there was half a dozen or more labs that were doc documenting the same thing. Finally, in 1923 and again in 1926, a group at the University of Michigan made a very broad statement. The amount of cholesterol we consume does not cause heart disease. It does not cause an increase in cholesterol. We sort of know that now. What causes that is animal protein. They change the total diet. So it's a major, but then we forgot that. And one of the interesting things about the history of science, every time somebody came up with an idea to suggest that animal protein is a problem, it was washed down the stream. So it's been, been so revered. And so we end up with some mythology. And I'm just saying this just for your thinking. The powerful carcinogen aflatoxin also can be made an anti-carcinogen, believe it or not, just for your thinking. We, I, we did that in our laboratory. We can take carcinogens and show that they're anti-carcinogen. It all depends on the level of exposure, depends on how we do it, and stuff like that. But that's a whole industry itself, again, that's been sustained for a long time. Unsaturated, unsaturated fats of plants are more carcinogenic than saturated fats. These are some, just some challenging ideas. Pro-inflammatory omega-6 fats actually are essential. They, they do serve a purpose. It just has to be that way. Okay, let me move on. I, I think time is running out on me here. It's just uh, 20 some minutes or so. Um, my, what I got into over the years <coughs> was actually a, a bunch of ideas that set the framework for a different kind of idea. And some of the things I just mentioned um, is that when you put all of it together, I kind of walk away from it. And there's no more time for discussion or argument. I know that sounds terribly arrogant. But the evidence is so strong on so many accounts. It is so many accounts. The idea of nutrition, as I say, is that. Whole food based nutrition up regulates good genes and down regulates bad genes. Forget the gene analysis thing. It's kind of interesting. You're for your tracing your family tree and stuff like that. But actually using genes to predict your risk of getting such and such a disease and keep on doing the same thing, no, not going to work. Nutrition controls genes in terms of genetic expression. Okay, it affects countless nutrients. The whole is greater than some of its parts. Okay, I'm going to skip through this here. Um, in the interest of time, but I'm just, I'm just listening to a bunch of stuff here that when I kind of extract out, filter out some of the key observations of this field, much of it, what we did ourselves, some of what others did, you put it together, it just becomes so overwhelmingly uh, informational. Okay, let me go through that. I want to get to the final thing here. There's a whole bunch of things. I call the whole food plant-based nutrition is a fact of nature. What we're discovering is what we're discovering in this business is nature. We're not building technologies. We shouldn't be building technologies. We're simply discovering nature. Just tell everybody what this is, and you can get the results. There's nothing like it. Um, it turns out that uh, my wife, who is here, I attribute to my success to what she did. That's our family of 22. We all. <laughs> We all eat this way, and, I, and Dr. Asselton can say the same thing, Dr. Du McDougald, and, and we're really kind of getting into it, so it's kind of personal in a way. Um, that's an old expression there that is as alive today as, as, as it was ever. The whole is greater than some of its parts. That's the way I see it. The idea of holism, it goes beyond biology, it gets into economics, it gets into this and that. Uh, it's a fascinating concept, I think. And hypocrisy is let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food, and you've heard that, I'm sure, too. Those two ideas there, they, the Greeks were onto this. I think we're coming back full, full circle. We're rediscovering what the Greeks already knew. This is where health is. And I think of all the things, that we, all the many difficulties that we have in the world today and arguments and services, I think we should put nutrition almost sit on the shelf, we sort of know what it can do, get on with it, devise systems, and make it happen so our fellow, uh, fellows can do it. There's some uh, things that came out of what we were doing. I skipped there. We have a plant-based, if you don't mind, I'm going to mention this, a plant-based nutrition certificate uh, that is online. We've had a lot of success with that. It's a partnership with Cornell University. Cornell now has 200 and some courses online. 
We, Mars is one of them. We're number one out of the 200 and something. Get a certificate for it. Doctors get CME credits and stuff like this. So that's what we're trying to do is to, to set up some systems for education. And I'm going to finish off with these two things here. And I put this up here uh, um, just simply to get your attention. Because I believe, one, number one, we have to define nutrition differently. We've got to get out of this track, this rut that we've been in. So we can describe it like this and then we can see the results. And it just happened in 2017. I published uh, six papers that are in a peer-reviewed uh, public access literature. So you can actually access them if you wish, uh, if you want to see what I'm doing, or see what, this, what I'm talking about. But these two papers I'm mentioning here are where I think the future of nutrition really will go. Um, the, one of them is called Nutrition Renaissance and Public Health Policy. I know you can't see, I just flipped them on the slide here just before I came here. The other is cancer treatment, cancer prevention treatment by holistic nutrition. I think that is a very, that's dynamite for the future of doing the kind of research that needs to be done so we can actually see what's going to happen. And unfortunately, I wish I could talk to you about all the public policy stuff that I've seen. It, that's, where, that's where it's been difficult and just trying to get politicians to accept it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. You're very generous. Appreciate that. Um, I do have, as according to the thing, I have, I want to save a few minutes for questions. If you have some, seventeen minutes. Said so 17 minutes? Yeah. Um, I, read one of, I read one of your papers, uh, the one on cholesterol, and not as, and you're just talking about it now, is not the cause of heart disease, um, but animal protein as the cause of heart disease. But cholesterol is part of animal protein. I mean, they. No, no, it isn't. So no, animal you, I'm confused. No, and, and cholesterol is a molecule, it's, it's an entity, it's a chemical entity. It's not part of animal protein. Animal protein is a, is a nutrient. It's defined by a sequence of amino acids. It just so happens that in animal food you get both. That's all. And one is not part of the other. There are two independent entities. What would be the problem with margarine? Just from reading your paper, um, and you had talked about the plant oils that came about right, and right. how they were a disaster. Right. Because at room temperature, they were a solid, and that, right. that right. was a problem. Right. But, it's, but if, you're, so if you're saying that it's animal protein, so this isn't an animal protein, well, so are you suggesting it's the chemicals and the oil in and of itself? or? I was confused. Well, I, I, I need to go back, I guess, and describe a little bit about what I mean by causation. If you designate a certain entity as being the cause of something, that means when you take it out, you should get some good results, right? In, in the opposite case, if something, one thing is good, you should be able to add to it and then see the goodness out of it, right? That's what I, I'm being kind of strict about the, the definition of causation. Dietary cholesterol, high cholesterol diets are bad. We, do, we should have zero cholesterol in our diets. Not because cholesterol all by itself causes the problem. There's a whole bunch of stuff causes the problem. When we do that, when we designate just one thing at a time, we do make mistakes. And margarine, come back to that, is a good case in point. Back in the 50s, actually we on the farm, I was still on the farm at the time, we used to value dairy milk uh, for its Butterfat content, we called it butterfat. That's the way milk was, was measured. Cows were valued according to how much butterfat they had in the, cow, in the milk. And so and we were right in the middle of that too, but I remember hearing that scene started to change, that conversation started to change a bit in the 50s. All of a sudden it was being said, oh, that fat of milk is not very good. And, and the milk problem was, that was said to be fat. Not the protein, didn't anybody say that? 
but that fat is a problem. So then what led out of that was to substitute that hard fat, saturated fats, with plant oils, because plant oils are said to be good, right? Because they're associated with lower cholesterol levels. So we started doing that. What they did, they dropped lard and butter, and they started to substitute with plant oils. But the plant oils are okay for frying and things like that, but it didn't spread. So the next thing was done, let's saturate that with hydrogen. So that gave rise to the margarine. You could spread it. So now they have a product, now it's saturated. Saturated is supposed to be bad. And you took these good oils and then made them saturated. That's the source of the trans fats. So in other words, you tried to solve one problem, create another one. And so uh, I say, and I happen to totally agree with Dr. Esselton on this, that we shouldn't use any added oil for a couple of different reasons. Number one, it does add uh, nutrient less energy. So it's kind of sopping up some of the parts of our caloric supply and not provide us the right kind of thing. The second thing, the plant oils, they sounded good when they were plants, and they were, they're part of the deal, they, you know, in a sense. Uh, but uh, when you when they, uh, turned into saturated fats, they're, they're not so good. But plant oils, saturated, if you take them out and just leave them liquid, if you, and then you put on your salad and you do some cooking stuff like that, most of those oils are omega-6 oils. And omega-6 oils are pro-inflammatory. Bad deal. Bad deal. So I say, you know, whole food plant-based diet, don't be adding back the oil, either in a recipe or in a frying pan or whatever, in salads. It, it, it's just, in fact, I think the added oil question, the polyunsaturates of added oil, there's still an oil form. Still an oil form. I think that may really account for quite a substantial proportion of the difficulties that we see by way of causation. Does that clarify it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, she skipped you. <laughs> Here's that lady up front here. <coughs> the plant-based ba plant diet has been promoted uh, for Alzheimer's patients. It's, it's what? In patients who have Alzheimer's disease. Is they, anybody they, using it, pl plant-based diet? Oh. Like Dr. Dale Bredesen, you know, is right, right. now being known with that. Right. Means, are you talking to him, or is he doing any, anything with his patients? Yeah, I, I've met Dr. Bredesen when he was at the Institute in California. In fact, I've lectured at his group and went out to dinner and so forth and so on. Very nice man, beautiful man, but I don't agree with what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, there, there, there are... <laughs> Does he agree about what you have to say? <laughs> well, you know, I, I say the whole food based diet, that's my, that's my story. Uh, but, you know, in the books that have been coming out in recent years, well, since Dr. Atkins did his first book in 1973. There's been a ton of books out there. And if you look at them, especially the ones that are arguing for low-carb intake, uh, I, I have a book called Low-Carb Fraud. Uh, those books, everybody's come along with something and saying, oh, this is, this is what accounts for it. And they're always avoiding one question, and that's eating animal foods or animal protein. So they don't talk about that one. And so uh, what's the guy's name? Um, they came out with uh, lectins. Grundy, Grundy, yeah. We, my son and I wrote a thing on that. I mean, they, they come up with this idea, lectins are no good. Well, they're in plants, basically. And it was, oh, that's what the whole thing is all about. It's just, you know, le lectins, don't eat the plants. You might get some lectins. It really is confusing the things. And, and this Dr. Grundy really had no publications in that area at all. So I see, I get really disturbed by the kind of books that are coming out tend to focus on one thing at a time, often with the effort to decrease or decrease the emphasis given to plants that Dr. Esselton, Dr. Ornish, Dr. McDougall, myself, a few others are talking about. So it's kind of a, and they make some money on that oftentimes too. They make the book. Like my friend Dr. Uh, McDougall first said to me, or I, he was the first time I heard say this, people like to hear good things about their bad habits. Quite a market. Yeah. Oh, here's that. Hi, 
Hi, hello, hi. I'm very, very honored to be here in front of you, first of all. Thank okay. you so for everything. And uh, from my heart, <laughs> uh, I've been a vegetarian for over 30 years, vegan now. Uh, natural hygiene, have you heard of natural hygiene? Mm. Right. right. Okay, anyway, so uh, my husband here, he has uh, type 2 diabetes. And this notion that pro you have to have protein, you have to have protein even if it's plant-based protein. And here we come and you're saying no protein. So... Uh, no, no animal protein. No animal protein. Yeah. But, but as I said before... Type 2 diabetes, you do need pro... you have to have the protein. The plants can supply that very easily. And fruits? Fruit, you, can you eat just fruits? Because it has a lot of sugar, some fruits. No, I, I don't hold that for fruits either. Yes, they have more uh, the, the, the uh, simple sugars, if you will. So people got caught up in that, like, too much, that, that story much too much. Um, in fact, the person who probably knows most about that is a certain Dr. David Jenkins at Toronto. He's sort of my age, Dr. Essel's age. I was talking to him recently. He thinks the sugar story is being overblown. And he, in fact, is the guy in the field who's done most with that, especially with diabetes. Anyhow, uh, when you're eating a whole food, you have to consider information you may have gotten elsewhere. You have to consider it in the context of the whole food. And people want to say something about a specific food because it's this, that, or something else, or it's missing something. I want to see the data. I can't, I, you know, I'm always willing to change my mind if I can see the evidence. But there's no evidence for that. And theoretically, I would argue that, you know, fruits are fine. If I, I say, say, I want to see real, reliable evidence. Right. What was the first question you had, though? Was something else run by, by besides fruits? No, oh, protein. The protein yeah, yeah. You, sir, you, you can get all the protein you need from just using whole food plant-based diets. And there's been a number of so-called jump starts or what do we call them, immersion programs, different folks are doing. And you know, they, a lot of diabetics are coming into that kind of... Um, experiment, if you will, that trial. Uh, it's not sanctioned in a sense, you know, by regular medicine, but the results are so overwhelming. If you want to get uh, more uh, experienced uh, information, I'd suggest you contact Dr. John McDougall, who has uh, been doing that, and there's others. Dr. Neil Bernard has some, done some of that too. And the protein thing is not a, you don't need the animal protein. It's going to cause you problems. Well, thank, th thank you for bringing your husband. Are you convinced? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, nuts, sorry. nuts, seeds, um, avocados, and the other question is this new study that came out now about asparagi. They what? tell you to not, today or yesterday, there was published all, it was all over the internet that it, aspar asparagi, which I think were molds, uh, what? About asparagus, that asparagus is one of the main foods that carries this. It's a new thing. But the well, nuts, seeds, and avocados, can you yeah. eat that whole? And they're rich in oil and protein. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And uh, this is where Dr. S and I might have a slightly different view about nuts. But he did his work with heart patients, and he kept them off of that. I'm not going to argue with Dr. Essen on that, so there you have it. Um, I, I think the nuts, you know, a little bit of nuts, you know, is okay. And uh, because nuts, I was, when I was early on, as, even as a student, going all the way back to my student days, nuts were always said to be a really good food because they had a lot of vitamin E. So when you look at it from that context, when you look at the whole food, nature did a pretty good job putting packaged stuff together. And so, uh, to blame nuts just because they have a certain kind of oil, I don't, I don't find the evidence su supporting that idea. Uh, but um, go easy on them. I, I think, not, I don't mean go easy, I mean, I, I can't come out and say, eat all the nuts you want to eat. No, I don't, I don't say that. That's it's part of a plan, that you can have some of that. And avocado, yeah, I don't find, I want to see the evidence. I'm always willing to change. I know, we use avocado. I like avocado, yeah. <laughs> it's not, you know, I'm not saying that because I like avocado. No, don't get me wrong. I just, yeah.
Pardon? Seeds? Seeds? Oh, sure. As long as seeds got a lot of good stuff on it. About the what? Sprouts. Is how, how high, Sprouts. How high are that on your? Well, on I've always thought, system? and this is thinking, just only thinking. I'd, I'd like to see more data on this point. But the sprouts are, you know, young uh, plants, obviously quite healthy at that point in time, loaded with the nutrients that's going to give them their full life. Uh, I, I can see an argument being made that sprouts. I know there's a lot of editorial claims that it's good, and. Uh, so I think sprouts are fine, but uh, I don't know. I can't quite go there as I can't go with a lot of things, making that the main, main whole diet. But yes, yes, good. I don't know, but in South America, I find out for, for many years, people, country people in their farms had been utilizing the seed of the avocado to sterilize horses and dogs. So I don't know how healthy it is to eat them here. I don't know. Yeah, and uh, just a comment. And my question was that um, have you, um, in your uh, studies with your song, uh, considered the emotional aspect of the illness into the research? Yeah, the emotional aspect uh, is associated with neurobiology, if you will, in some ways, behavioral, emotional, stress, all of that thing. It's very interesting. I, that's about all I can say. I, uh, I, from what I hear tell, and this is from a certain physician in, uh, in this business in uh, Oklahoma, Neil Nedley is his name, who was a regular doctor, started treating people for stress problems and that sort of thing, um, and uh, getting some real benefits. Published a book on it, made a video, and uh, that's very interesting. And I, I just uh, yesterday Pat got a book sent to me by a, a professor who has both a PhD and an MD, researcher and a clinician at Princeton University. Quite a book. I haven't gotten too far into it, but he's claiming that he can get a lot of benefits from changing a diet like that. Yeah, good. I tell most of my consultants, an organic apple is not going to make a trick. He has, a, like you say, it's a whole yeah. a spiritually, emotionally, physiological right. part of it. And also that you say to uh, wish you luck I for your son and the studies, and I personally don't believe in luck, but I have been sending you positive light to you, to your son, and to these people, so we can demonstrate it. Because it's not just new. Mr. Fletcher, 100 years ago, did it. Tesla mentioned it about the in tremendous implication of the stage of mind in the overall health. So it's going to happen. Yeah, there's a lot of ideas out there, as you know, that sound kind of interesting, and I can. I could dream up uh, arguments why they should work and that kind of thing, uh, oftentimes. Or, but I, I really like the idea of just going with the whole, the whole foods: vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, and you know, nuts and seeds and so forth. A little, some of that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Somebody in the back, I guess. I'm wondering what we can do um, about the tremendous influence of lobbyists who are against all these um, healthy things. Um, how does one penetrate that? It's not related to any particular political party. It's all about the money. Yeah, well, I had mentioned before, I, I wrote this history paper some years ago and then sort of been putting it together. I've really gotten as much interested in the political sort of shenanigans that go on with respect to this kind of information as I do in the laboratory. In fact, as I said, I spent 20 years in, uh, uh, on expert panels, you know, de determining and making recommendations for the government. And I've seen enough. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's absolutely true. You know, th I, th here's a concept I kind of like. Money is power. Everybody agree with that? Money is power. We've had that around for generations, for centuries. Money is power. P power, um, no, I'm sorry. I said that. I'm sorry about that. Erase it from that. Knowledge is power. Yeah, sorry about that. I need to eat more plant-based foods to get it working. <laughs> Knowledge is power. How do we measure power for the most part? Money, right? 
So you've got knowledge is power, knowledge is power, power becomes money, and people who acquire power and money, they've got a big operation, maybe it's a corporation, whatever, they've got power and they've got money, what are they going to do to protect their interests in the future? They're going to go back and control knowledge. So at the center of this, on this triangular sort of arrangement, it's about who controls the knowledge. And if you start looking at history, and you start uh, wondering about the message we get into, like the Affordable Care Act and stuff like that, they're not, I don't care which side of the aisle we're on, they're talking only about, you know, who's going to pay the future bill? They're not talking about improving health by giving them information. It's all about knowledge. So this question concerning through history and at the present time, it's who's fighting for the, the place on the, ta you know, at the, on the stage to control the knowledge. That's what it's about. And I find the government to be particularly onerous in this re regard because the government, and I've sat on those panels, oftentimes organized by governments, I've given testimony for congressional committees, so I've seen it. The government is the best we have the best government the money can buy. That's a statement from a good friend, Howard Lyman, I first heard, who was a lobbyist for a bit. He is so right. We have the best money that money can buy. So if we're talking about this thing in a health context, uh, we've got to address that question as well. And uh, I'm, at the present time, involved in some things, you know, just along those lines. How do we deal with that? You know, so... You're absolutely right. It's about money, it's about power, but it's all about controlling knowledge is what it is. Yes. Uh, yeah. So when we had the uh, lecture earlier about the medications, I don't know if you were here, um, and we were talking now about emotional health and stress and all that, so, I, and um, Brian from Hippocrates was saying that they get every single possible type of illness that comes to Hippocrates, and most of the time they get to help these people out. I'm wondering if people have mental illness, so to speak, or however you want to define it. Um, do these diets, the whole food, help that in itself so that perhaps we can get off some of the medications and have different treatments? No, I'm going to say I believe it. I can't, um, because I've heard enough about it and it makes enough sense. There is a sort of a quieting, uh, it sort of tends to eat this way. I think people are a little less stressed out. I think there's a, d a d degree of calmness that comes with this kind of eating. And, and, and I'm talking about, I have to say, it's anecdotal evidence or you know, meeting with friends in the area and so forth and so on. So I'm. I, I can be wrong on that, but I think it does. It really uh, creates a little more settled, if you will, psychology, for sure. What do you mean calmness? Pardon? What do you mean by calmness? Comments? Calm. Calm. Oh, calmness. Yeah, just not being so, uh, so much angst, so much uh, feeling so much stress all the time. I think if, if you're eating this way, really feeling good about yourself, uh, your health is good, uh, maybe just stands the reason you're going to be less, de less tense. And uh, I think you just, I'm, as I say, I'm kind of thinking out loud just like you, you might want to think out loud. But I wish we had more evidence on that, but it looks from what I see as being a good link. <coughs> There's some people on their way to back, I don't know whether they want to go back to that part. Or, or. Can you, can you hold just a second? I want to see who you are. <laughs> you say that animal uh, protein causes cancer, or causes, is a cause of heart disease. Okay, there's a correlation there. So my question to you is, as mammals, why do we start our first three years off in life, or two years off in life, as a mother who lactates? no matter what mammal I am. Fantastic idea, very good. You know, there's a place for everything. And I've been asked this before about this milk thing and what about mothers nursing babies? 
the most important thing we do in our lives is to be nursed. There's a time and place for everything. And human milk is, if there's a perfect food, that is a perfect food. Yes, it contains cholesterol. Yes, it contains saturated fat and so forth. But there's, and it's got a lot, good supply of protein. And it's animal protein at that. But that's for the first two years. We're the only species, it seems to me, on the face of the planet that keeps on using this fluid from the udder beyond the winning period. And then we turn around and get it from another animal. Have you done any research on when the time period you stop? So no. I'm not, that, that's not my territory. I, I can't answer that question. Um, I, I just can't. But let me tell you, it does remind me of something I heard many years ago. And we got involved in doing some studies on this and published it in science, actually. There was a gentleman from the University of Iowa Medical Center in, in those days who was following infant boys. It was called the longitudinal, infant boy longitudinal study, something like this. And so the question in those days, this is late 60s, early 70s, uh, it was uh, all this discussion about cholesterol, and a question just like what you said. What about mother's milk has got cholesterol in it? Maybe that's not good. And so some of the, the uh, what do you call it, these formula things were being developed at the time, and some arguments were being made, usually by industry, that the plant-based infant formulas were better than mother's milk. That, that was one of the silly arguments that were made, but this, this, this man, uh, professor at University of Iowa, he started this study following little boys, I think, I forget how many he had, 2,000, I think. It was a good study. And so he measured the cholesterol in the boys when they're born. And the boys who were born and nursed by mother's milk, their average cholesterol level was 110. Mind, mind you, cholesterol in the serum gradually goes up with age until puberty, and it kind of plateaus or whatever. Um, but there was 100, their average was 110 at the, being nursed. The boys on the infant formula, plant-based, was 98. Ah, oh, they said, this is it. You know, these boys are starting at 110, mother's milk, and so forth and so on. That's not good. This is, this is an, a reduction argument was made. They followed him for seven years, and when he came to Cornell and pulled out of his pocket his late, latest data, he showed the, the, the increase in cholesterol on mother's milk babies, starting at 110, gradually going up, as normally is the case. They were at 140 by year seven. The other star that was, not, uh, that was a start with 110, it got from 110 up to 140. The others on 98, they looked like they were better, they were now 170. So it led to the concept, at least for me, that there was some imprinting going on here. We called it imprinting, you know, during infancy and during lactation. That those experiences at that age, whether we're, you know, uh, in utero, or whether we are lactating, whatever, those, those events that are occurring is just one of the properties of nature, conditioning us for subsequent ability to do whatever we have to do. And so the way I'm looking at it, will prove that the early exposure to cholesterol is, is probably a good idea at that time. It's appropriate. And so we did some studies, actually, in rats and showed the same thing. And then we published our, our stuff in science. And it, it generated quite a lot of uh, other papers at that time on that whole concept of imprinting. And uh, I, I think it's really important. There's some other ideas that have surfaced over the years along the same lines. It's, it's actually, actually a pretty common sort of phenomenon now. And infant children who are exposed to infectious diseases, for example, are probably better off than those who are not because it gives them some ability to you know, get the resistance going for later life. So um, it's just one of the phases in our lifetime where we, we can't focus on one thing one time and try to draw big conclusions from that. We've got to really, really look at the totality of the experience. I don't know whether that helps you or not, but um, as far as you know, how long you have to nurse, I have no idea. I never nursed, so I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> what the answer is. Yeah, okay, so my time is up. Yeah, so um, thank you again. Very appreciate it.